morning. Thank you very much for the organizers for letting us present our work. My name is Zenab. I'm one of the renal trainees at Great Ormond Street currently, but my work is from um, Evelina Children's Hospital. I'm going to be talking about does pre-transplant viremia status affect outcomes in pediatric renal transplant recipients at one year post-transplant. Just a bit of background. Um, we know recent pediatric renal transplant outcome data focuses more on graft and patient survival and cardiovascular outcomes. But there's a dearth of data regarding viremia um, post-renal transplant. We know that children with post-renal, um, with post-transplant viremias have frequent monitoring and um, adjustment of their immune suppression. With the move in UK towards harmonization of maintenance immune suppression, we wanted to look at our outcomes. At Evelina, currently, um, if a child receives a CMV positive to negative um, organ, they receive Valgan cyclovir prophylaxis for three months post-transplant. Um, and post-transplant, we continue to monitor them depending on their levels of PK, EBV, and CMV monthly and more frequently if the viremias are high. And they continue post-transplant, year post-transplant even afterwards if they are high. A significant viremia as counted as a log of three, so if you've got two levels or more of three um, log, then you are, um, we think about reducing the immune suppression. So the aim of this um, project was to look at the viremia status, rejection episodes, and EGFR at one year post-transplant or children who were viremia naive, that is EBV and CMV naive at the time of transplant, to those who were not. For this, we retrospectively reviewed all the cases in our center who were on an azathioprine-based maintenance immune suppression and were followed up locally in a recent three-year cohort. All the statistics were performed using SPSS. Of the 50 children who were transplanted during the study period, 35 were followed up locally, um, of which six were excluded because they were um, commenced on MMF-based immune suppression or rapid steroid wean. So the study cohort included 29 children, of whom 40% were EBV and CMV IgG naive at the time of transplant, and 60% were viremia exposed. This table represents the demographics of the children. So as you can see, age, gender, and underlying etiology is pretty much similar in both the groups, with the viremia exposed group slightly older. Um, all the kidneys were well matched with the maximum mismatch of three, and most of the children received living donation. In the viremia naive group, um, there were 12 children, six of whom required um, valgan cyclovir prophylaxis. All were viremia positive at the end of one year post-transplant, either for EBV, CMV, BK, or both. Ten, ten of these 12 children required reduction in their immune suppression, and of these, three were not on any azathioprine at the end of, post, um, at the end of the first year post-transplant, so they were only on taclimus or PRED. There were two um, significant rejection episodes during this period in this cohort, one of which was post-reduction in their immune suppression. And the mean EGFR was calculated using the Schwartz formula, which, in which the coefficient was 31.5, and in this cohort it was 62 <coughs> mils per minute per meter square at the end of first year post-transplant. In the viremia exposed group of the 17 children in this group initially, one was excluded because of a primary non-functioning kidney, so there was a graft loss. Um, three of these children received Valgan cyclovir prophylaxis, six of which of the 16 were viremia positive at the end of first year post-transplant, with five of them requiring reduction in their immune suppression and one on no antiproliferative agent at the end of first year post-transplant. There were four children who developed um, significant TSA mediated rejection in this group, which was treated with methylprednisolone, and the EGFR in this group was 59 mils per minute per meter square. So in conclusion, pre-transplant viremia naive children were more likely to develop significant viremias post-transplant, but there was no difference in rejection episodes or EGFR when compared to viremia exposed group. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.
Thank you. Any questions? Can I ask how does this compare to the Gosh experience? the CMV which Virimia which was every every week uh, for the first month and then uh, we weaned we now have a where Sheila I can see her there mm -hmm. yep we now have a, a process where we do the same where we would give valgancyclovir prophylaxis but um, we have some data to show that we have are seeing some patients who still develop CMV viremia when you stop the prophylaxis as well. So there's a big debate whether you use it for three months or then six months in everyone. And my problem is, is if you use it for six months, then you're seeing the patients less frequently and you're doing less bloods. Yeah. And then we've seen patients then present when they've not had a blood test for about a month or two. Exactly. So it's very similar. Yeah. Any other questions? Can we ask what is the, uh, the Innsbruck experience? We, in the surgical department, we are not um, really involved in the follow-up of the kids. So for the, but we do the prophylaxis as well as the same as we do for the adults, and it's always, it's always at the center. What for? No, 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 it's not. It, it's definitely not. So for the livers, we use um, Simulect, and for the kidneys as well. But for the adults, it would depend on the um, immunological status, yeah. Great, any other questions? Why do you exclude uh, mycophenolate? Do you want just to be consistent in your group or, or do you think there's going to be a different pattern uh, with mycophenolate present? So Evelina, prior to 2019, January, has mostly for the pleuris transplants use um, azathioprine only. So the MMF group is quite small. So if you can see in that cohort, there were only three children who were on MMF. So it would be very small, difficult to compare it at all. But now with harmonization, we're moving towards um, starting MMF on these children as well. So it'd be good to compare once we have an MMF group as well. Great, Zainab, thank you very much. That's very kind. So um, now we move on to Anna, representing Minnesota via Guys. Um, pancreas transplantation in a child with type 1 diabetes and allergy to manufactured insulin preparations. Thank you, Anna. Uh, hello. So, uh, as Peter said, I'm working at a guy's hospital, but this work is from University of Minnesota, where I recently been a fellow. And thank you very much, organizer, for giving me a chance to present um, a case of uh, pancreas transplantation in the child. Um, the girl was with type 1 diabetes and allergy to manufactured, manufactured insulin preparations. So um, yesterday we, we heard excellent talk about uh, simultaneous kidney and pancreas transplantation, and we we know that it's rare uh, in kids. Pancreas transplant alone is even um, less common. There are a few uh, cases documented. Um, indications uh, would be hypoglycemia and awareness, consistent failure of their therapeutic approaches. Uh, that's general for pancreas transplant alone in uh, adult population. Uh, as I said, the hologram pancreas transplantation is very, very uncommon in children. Uh, but uh, our girl was quite special. She was 21 years old when she was referred to the University of Minnesota. She was allergic to pres uh, preservatives present in insulin preparation, um, different preservatives. So this way she was allergic to all types of insulin for some to some, even she responded with anaphylactic reaction. She tolerated only short-acting insulin with pre-medication each time she received it. Uh, she required high insulin uh, doses um, and she had consistently hives, uh, rash, um, chronic abdominal pain, uh, secondary to chronic histamine release, um, and um, uh, some knowledge experience from most one of the day that um, significantly affected her quality of life and quality of life of her family. She had brittle diabetes with erratic diabetic control. Blood glucose would range for between 40 and 500. Hemoglobin A1C, which she referred to the our center, was 7.6. She had some hypoglycemia and awareness, but she has never been hospitalized for it. She also developed peripheral neuropathy. 
Um, nine months after she was listed, um, donor became available uh, that we accepted for her. It was 23-year-old uh, man who died gunshot wound to the head. That was a uh, DPD donor. We procured that organ. Mismatch was uh, two to two. Um, we had like just classical approach uh, to the surgery. The technique um, uh, was uh, as we common, most commonly used now in the adult population. So we had systemous venous drainage. We use y graft for arterial reconstruction uh, and enteric drainage of exocrine secretion. She had a good possibility of recovery, no surgical complications. Immunosuppression we used was the standard protocol we used for adult patients, uh, which was induction with metoprednisol and thymoglobulin. Uh, she had, um, a few weeks after her transplant, she had acute cellular ejection diagnosed with the biopsy, which we treated with uh, thymoglobin initially, and uh, then with uh, Campath. Her current maintenance therapy is tacrolimus, everolimus, microphenolate, pernisol on small dose. So currently, um, she remains normally glycemic without the need for any insulin. Uh, her peripheral neuropathy improved. Her cognitive function improved. She was able to go back to school. Um, and the quality of her life, quality of her life, her family, um, parents and siblings has significantly improved. So in conclusion, um, she is a youngest uh, pancreas transplant on a recipient that we've documented one year graft survival. And um, pancreas transplant a lot is a feasible uh, therapeutic option for very selective children with diabetes mellitus. I, I do not advocate it for many, but in very selective cases, if it's, uh, it should be considered if um, there are significant benefits that were uh, override, obviously, the risk of surgical complications, burden of immunosuppression. And this is her picture. She, this is a very, um, um, this is a Minneapolis. She, uh, she drew this picture for me, so I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Anna. How, how do you diagnose your rejection beside biopsy on this patient? How do you do a preemptive knowledge? And number two, tell me about why you think that quadruple suppression is good for her. Um, so to answer the first question, uh, diagnosis of rejection is based on lipase levels and by, followed by biopsy. So, uh, with initial, so we monitor lipase like daily in the hospital on every clinic visit. Uh, if lipase is going up, it's not necessarily needs to mean the rejection. There can be other factors, but with remains high without some intervention, um, then we do the biopsy. And we have low threshold in her to do the biopsy because the pancreas transplant alone and um, there was a mismatch. It was cellular rejection. We also monitor donor specific antibodies. And at some point, she developed a few, but very low, like MFIs. And the biopsy is never suggested like humoral rejection. So that's the answer to the first question. That's okay. And the second question, so this is unusual combination of, um, and it's because we really were struggling to maintain this lever in her case. There may be some, uh, and um, keep, so the prednisolone is something that we would normally do not have eventually, but we're still keeping it because uh, she had, uh, as I said, because she had uh, those two episodes of rejection. Um, and just wore it, so that's prednisolone. Uh, tacrolimus levels uh, were difficult to maintain. She had some difficulties probably with absorption and was very much fluctuating. We need to use sublinguinal form and we could not go with very high le levels, the usual levels, because she had side effects. Um, and uh, we kept uh, antimetabolite, we um, microphenolate, and we just add the fourth agent at some point, because we tried both, both two tacrolimus and cellulimus go to the levels that will be to decrease the side effects, basically, things that she could tolerate. I have one question. How is the kidney doing with this combination of mm -hmm. maintenance immunosuppression? And what is, your, what is for this combination 
what's your sum trough level? So are you then aiming for 12 to 14 altogether, or is the tacrolimus leading, or is everolimus leading? It's also tacrolimus leading, but we having level something be uh, around 10. All together? Uh, no, no, no. We Tacrolimus levels will be aiming around 10. We can say between 8 and um, 11, but we'll uh, try to be around. Secondary took some time actually to achieve the level, and then we went down on tacrolimus. And um, are you treating the pancreas rejections always already with a depletion antibody, or do you start a course of three steroids of steroids in that? In no, we start a course of steroids. Uh, we obviously have a biopsy results know how severe, how bad it is. Uh, so with that was a trial of steroids, then. Um, uh, thymoglobulin uh, and the repeated biopsy uh, still show the uh, rejection of eosinophilic inflammation and that's when we use ones of decampath. It's not uh, a usual treatment. And then we show, show improvement on the follow-up biopsy. And the kidney function, uh, she had some fluctuation with the creatinine but kidney function remains normal. It was mostly with the problems of the fluid intake and she needed some uh, outpatient uh, IV fluids and encouraged to drink. And that's, that's fine for now. So I've got one question if I can ask. So this is a very unusual indication for pancreas transplantation. Mm -hmm. It's also unusual in terms of the timeline that you have to, to treat it because you have some with diabetes so you can't actually manage. Um, two questions. What were, the re what were the regulatory requirements to get us approved or were there any? Uh, did you have to go through an ethics committee? And secondly, how quickly were you able to do the transplant from the time that you realized the transplantation was required? Mm, there was no ethic committee. Okay. Uh, basically, she was uh, self -refer initially self-referred to our center and there was a multidisciplinary meeting that we approved her uh, for transplantation. Um, so it took two months from the time she was referred to the center until she was waitlisted, uh, and nine months, I said, for, to be transplanted. What was the other question? Perfect. That's it. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. So we're going to move on to the next case, um, who's Yoon Yi Hu uh, from uh, uh, GOSH and UCLH, talking about successful ABO and HLA-incompatible renal transplants in children in the UK. So. So, um, hi, <laughs> morning. So I'm a fifth year medical student at uh, UCL um, Medical School. So I'll be presenting the um, work done at Great Ormishi Hospital regarding the successful AVO and HLA incompatible renal transplantation in children in the UK over the last decade, which is led um, by Dr. Stephen Marks. So um, I'll just click next. So um, over the last decade, so um, AVO and HLA incompatible renal transplantation has become more common in adult setting. So although encouraging data has emerged in the adult setting, so the renal incompatible transplantation in children is still rare. So this may be due to technical difficulties when administrating plasma pharesis in children, for example, um, difficulty in vascular access because like children, they have smaller veins. Um, and also the concerns about potential increased risk of rejection as the immune system differs in the children. For example, immune system matures in puberty in children and also children are born with a fully functioning thymus. So therefore, overall, ABO and HLA incompatible renal transplantation is considered high risk. So many centers um, do not feel that it is a viable option for children with end-stage kidney disease. So over the last 25 years, so the increasing organ shortage and sensitization of children have resulted in strategies to ensure that ABO and HLA incompatible renal transplantation can be performed in children. So the good news is that the there's increasing evidence of good short-term and medium-term outcomes for um, ABO, and ABO and HLA incompatible renal transplantation uh, with pre-transplant positive cross-matches in pediatric practice. However, there are concerns that children have both a higher risk of rejection and a higher risk of infective complications with the possibility of developing Epstein-Barr viral-induced post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorder. So um, next I'll talk about more of the desensitization protocol. Um, so the desensitization protocols are personalized depending on the antibody titers and the immune response to treatment prior to the transplant. 
So in general, so the a for ABO incompatible transplantations, so the pre-transplant antibody removal using immunoadsorption columns was used for patients with baseline titles of greater than 64, uh, as seen over there. So it is important to note that the columns um, should have a high capacity for ABO antibody removal and a minimal effect on coagulation. So double filtration plasma phoresis or DFPP, um, which is a less specific but more cost-effective alternative was used for patients with baseline titles between 16 and 64, uh, as the need for a smaller number of treatments meant a limited effect on coagulation. So um, routine pre-transplant antibody, antibody removal was omitted for those with antibody baseline titles of eight or lower. So, but for all, um, regardless of what, uh, whichever the title is, rituximab was used. So in HLA-I patients, um, it was not mentioned here in the, the slides, but for HLA-I patients, preoperative antibody removal using DFPP or immunoadsorption was systematically performed. So um, for um, ABOI patients, so the target pre-transplant is to reach NTA or NTB um, antibody titles of eight or lower. So for HLAI patients, flow cytometric cross-match is performed on T and B lymphocytes between the patient's serum and negative control serum. So, um, so that was the desensitization protocol. So next, on, in terms of how do we get our data? So our data were obtained from the UK Transplant Registry on all children below the age of 18 who received a first living pediatric kidney-only transplant between the 1st of January 2006 and the 31st of December 2016 from 10 UK pediatric uh, transplant centers. So the baseline demographic data were collected of 709 patients of which 23 were ABOI and um, seven or four were HLAI. So following transplantation, the graph functions were then compared between the ABOI, so HLAI, and also ABO-HLA compatible transplant groups. So to obtain the long-term follow-up, so we created a questionnaire, and these um, questionnaires specifying the renal transplant type, desensitization requirement, and graph functions were sent to these 10 transplant centers. So the EGFR was then calculated using the modified Schwartz formula with um, plasma creatinine values and heights. So the results on biopsy proven acute Result, uh, rejection episodes were obtained where available. So borderline T-cell mediated rejection were reported with the earliest episode reported at day 16 post-transplant. So, um, so this was the questionnaire that um, we made. So it was a three-page questionnaire that we sent to the transplant centers. So here, yep. So these are the results. So the preemptive transplantation occurred in 35% and 25% of ABOI and HLAI recipients with delayed graph function of 0 to 6% without primary, uh, primary non-function. So the rena uh, renal um, allograft survival was 100% in each group, although there were two deaths of ABOI pediatric renal transplant recipient, but each had a functioning graph in the beginning um, for each. So these were the results that we obtained for renal allograft advantages compared to dialysis. But the waiting times, um, as you all know, are uh, long with limited options for highly sensitized patients. So highly sensitized children are, also, uh, children are also unlikely to receive kidneys via national living donor kidney uh, sharing schemes as they are usually sensitized to common antigens like um, the HLA antigens. So for highly sensitized patients, the positive cross-match transplantation after appropriate desensitization may lead to better patient survival than rather than staying on dialysis. So the discussions that we had is that longer, longer term follow-up with more children would be needed. So um, other improvements would, uh, we would be more interested in actually looking forward would be also the type of immunization, uh, the type of kind of um, immunosuppression to use. So, so far we have done is after three months. So later on, like what kind of immunosuppression that we use, whether we stop using steroids or not afterwards will be something that we will look for, forward into. So that could be included in a questionnaire later on. And also um, something to, in terms of the limitations of the questionnaire, like um, so for example, uh, we did it in terms of paper form. So like maybe digitalize it or something. So that's something that we could include in the discussion as well. And um, uh, so far, and also another thing that we've 
done so far is a certain registry, which is the registry that involves um, the centers um, throughout Europe. So that would uh, involve more data and also um, includes more centers as well. So that's why an extensive and continuous collaboration with other pediatric renal transplant centers is needed to further investigate the outcomes of AVO and HLA incompatible transplantation. So these um, are um, the members of our um, team and also, a big, also um, thank you for all the patients, families and units in the UK as well. Great, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Any questions? Anna. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I just want a clarification. So your uh, um, HLA incompatible transplantations yes. included, they were all cross-match positive, correct? Yes, yeah, they were. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? No. So I'm going to ask Dr. Marks a question. If you were to speak to a skeptical pediatric renal transplant center who said we're not touching this, this is high risk, it's lunacy, and you had to pitch to them in one sentence, what evidence would you quote? So the, the first thing I would say is if you, if you look what you and you said at the end was as we'll, we'll, we're trying to do it through certain, and we've realized that there's all these people in Europe saying, talking about blood group and HLA incompatible transplant, but they've actually not done one. They've just read what's in the manuscripts. For the patients that we have um, with Nizam, Nikos and Yelna, we've very much um, identified the correct patient, put them through the National Living Donor Kidney Sharing Scheme where possible to show that they haven't been, una been unable to get a kidney transplant that way, and then informed them with the fact that there are, is an increased risk, especially with HLA incompatible compared to the ABO incompatible, but low teeter ABO incompatible is not a huge increase in risk. So I think it depends on the patient, on their dialysis, their access, but we have an early scheme of speaking to them and informing them of the risks that are potentially involved um, because we have seen infective complications. So going back to the idea of informed consent, do we have a sufficient database or sufficient information to actually provide them with figures on morbidity and mortality? Yeah, so we, we tell them about the patient, you know, about the risks and infectious complications, um, and we quote them our data plus also the data internationally as well. So I think HLA incompatible with a positive cross match is very different. And to answer Anna's question as well, the NHSBT told us of cases which were HLA incompatible in other centres, but they weren't positive cross matches, so we actually excluded them from the data. They're high immunological risk, but they're not HLA incompatible. Great, thank you. Someone who has a question? Would you consider the classified? The first lecture was very good. The best presentation was very interesting about the risk of viral infections and the, the repercussions, so still early. Are you going to make something different for patients that are naive and not naive? Because you're getting, you're really ratcheting up all your immunosuppression and pretty ablative therapy. What what were you using? So, is this something that you're going to include in your consent and according to age and according to intensity of your treatment? Well, it's interesting because the small infants are the ones who very often, if you're doing a blood group ABO incompatible transplant, they have low teeters because your teeters are low through the first uh, year of life and even into the second year of life. So we have the infants and the youngest who, who was about 18 months, had an ABO incompatible transplant but had a teeter of one in eight. So, but those kids are more likely going to be EBV naive. So I think you do have to match. And that's why we used to give rituximab to everybody when we started, but we only give them now for teeters of one in eight and above. Yeah, I mean, just to follow up on that. so. Um, I, I lead the antibody incompatible program and um, in adults we've done 116 blood group incompatibles uh, using that tailored protocol. We haven't found any increase in infections in that group. Um, so I think for, for blood group incompatibles, um, I don't think giving the rituximab and immunoabsorption or, or plasma exchange pre-transplant, I don't think that makes a big difference. But HLA incompatibles, we do see um, some cases of severe sepsis. That's usually related to treatment of aggressive rejection postoperatively. 
and we're trying to get control of that. That's really the worry.